Hi, uh, my name is James Bowman. I work um, uh, just uh, the other side of El Camino at Willow Garage, which is a small um, robotics company. Uh, we build a, um, a robot which is um, about the size of a trash can, only significantly more expensive. Um, it looks like well, excuse me, I'm getting my slides going here. Uh, it's about this big. Um, it has a uh, head on the top, which is um, uh, where it has its uh, cameras. It has two stereo cameras, um, which is what you can see right in the uh, in the middle here. This is uh, pair one, and this is pair two of stereo cameras. One black and white, one color. Uh, it has uh, um, a high resolution camera, uh, which is two megapixels, uh, and it has a um, a texture projector which projects a textured pattern onto nearby objects uh, so that they show up in the stereo camera. One of the problems with doing um, uh, stereo for um, computer vision is that objects don't have any texture on them, so you can't pick up those texture details. Our eyes kind of work much better when they're looking at textured objects and they can, they can resolve the, um, uh, uh, the stereo information from texture. So in typical use, this giant, powerful red eye is blinking non-stop at about 30 hertz. And then these two stereo cameras are, um, are uh, two pairs of stereo cameras are uh, uh, extracting 3D information. So each of those cameras is um, on the uh, ethernet that uh, connects the entire robot. We've got 1000 base T running up and down the robot. And each one is, uh, is one of these. It's it's a tiny little um, uh, board, which is about, um, about 30 millimeters on a side. Uh, we've got a, a 64480 video sensor at 30 frames a second. Uh, they've got um, a PHY, uh, some flash for loading up the, um, uh, the FPGA. And what we've got to do is hit 640 by 480 at 30 frames a second. Uh, Non-stop. The um, Aptina sensor doesn't wait for you, obviously. It, it's constantly streaming these pixels down, and then we pick them up off the sensor and then send them over UDP. Uh, another thing that we have to do is um, synchronize externally, because when you're running stereo cameras, both of the cameras need to be um, taking their, um, uh, running their shutters uh, synchronously. Otherwise, everything looks really, uh, really weird. Uh, so we have an external sync line coming in, and the cameras are running off the sync line. So every, um, every um, uh, 33 milliseconds, we're getting a sync signal. We take a fit picture with both cameras, put them both onto the, um, uh, onto the Ethernet. Uh, we chose this FPGA just because um, there was a sort of a general feeling that uh, our application would fit on it. Uh, uh, it's got uh, a bunch of RAM um, and we uh, set aside 16K bytes for code, and then we're going to use the rest for doing uh, simple image processing operations. So we actually iterated a couple of times on this. The first time we took um, what a lot of people do, it's, it's a really popular route, is to take Microblaze, which is Xilinx's um, soft core, and then put it on the FPGA. It gives you a, a GCC uh, tool chain. It's a, it's a, a pretty standard 32-bit processor, and it ran for us um, at about 40 MIPS. And we went with that, and we built a prototype uh, using that software. Um, it had a number of problems. Um, one is that the code density for that CPU was um, not good. Just, just a few lines of C code turned into lots and lots of um, these 32-bit machine instructions. Uh, so we immediately ran out of room. We couldn't fit the entirety of the algorithm that we wanted, even though the camera is pretty simple. All it does is boot up the imager and then copy data off the imager onto the network. We couldn't actually get it to fit in the, uh, in the code. So all sorts of things were done to squeeze it in. Um, the 
Other thing we ran out of is time. It isn't fast enough to stream video data. So 40 MIPS uh, seems like you might be able to do 9 megapixels a second um, over the network, but of course, we coded up this inner loop to grab a pixel off the sensor and then copy it into the um, Ethernet uh, packet. Uh, that turned into a lot of machine, a lot of these extremely large machine instructions, and so the throughput rate was just not there. So our hardware guys decided that, of course, what they would do is build a DMA controller, which would you'd set it up, and then it would automatically um, grab these uh, pixels off the sensor, copy them onto the um, Ethernet uh, adapter and then uh, launch the packet in a sort of quasi-autonomous way so that the CPU was just in charge of housekeeping. This is hard to get right because there's a lot of simultaneous things going on and you've got ring buffers and, and you've got these two asynchronous processes going on that you're copying data between. So um, it turned into an awful lot of code and uh, it was very hard to debug and hard to simulate with all of the various timing things that can happen. So I thought we were, um, it was just us who had this experience, but here's something I encountered the other week uh, of people who'd used exactly the same component. Uh, some kids uh, tried to build a web server as their, uh, as their group project in their final year. <laughs> and this is exactly what happened to us. You've got, you're write, writing this code which only just fits. I think when I first came to this, uh, to the camera project, we had six bytes free uh, of code. I was like, well, what am I going to do? Uh, and so they had just the same situation, um, constantly trying to find things to, to switch off in the code in order to make any progress at all. Uh, so naturally, uh, I immediately turned to fourth. Uh, and uh, I had an old CPU I'd been messing around with, and I decided to use it at work. Um, it's 16-bit uh, instruction, 16-bit data, so there doesn't seem to be very much in this project that involved 32-bit data. Network stuff occasionally involves 32-bit quantities, but uh, not enough to really justify a 32-bit CPU. Uh, and I thought we could get it fast enough to just um, copy the pixels across in a while loop. I didn't want to have these... Um, uh, these uh, DMA um, hardware components which occasionally lock up. So pretty simple. All it's going to do is take the pixels off the imager, copy them onto the network adapter, and then send them. Uh, CPU design is something I had lying around, as I said. Um, it's not complicated. Uh, so these are the um, uh, five flavors of instruction. Literal pushes a literal on the stack. The, the three transfer of control words are, are fairly obvious if, if you've ever used a fourth machine. Conditional jump um, pops the top of the stack and then jumps if it's non-zero. Uh, and then the real action uh, as far as the CPU is, is all in this ALU instruction. Uh, there's a, uh, uh, it's a bit like the um, Novix design in that it's horizontally microcoded. Uh, so just running through what it actually has here for bits. This is the return bit. Uh, this four-bit field here tells you, um, uh, tells it which um, ALU operation to do. I'll run through those in a moment. This bit, if it's on, copies the top of stack into the, into the uh, second thing on the stack. This bit copies the top of stack onto the AR stack. Uh, this bit copies the top of stack into um, the memory address, copies the next thing on the stack. Well, this is basically um, store. Uh, and then these two-bit fields uh, tell it how far to move the R stack and the uh, D stack at the end of the instruction. So you, they can go up or down depending on uh, whether these are plus one, zero, or minus one. And there are two of those. Um, and those fields together are enough to implement the, um, uh, all of the uh, basic uh, fourth words, right? So, for example, plus there is encoded as um, the operation is T plus N on the ALU. Um, and then you can see on the right-hand side it says D minus 1. That means move the data stack down one. And the same with all the other binary operators. Um, it can do swap in a single cycle because when you swap 
Uh, the top of the stack gets loaded with um, n, the next thing on the stack, and we want to copy the old top of the stack into the um, n at the end of the cycle. So swap happens in a single cycle, and so on. All of the other um, fourth, fourth words get uh, implemented in the same way. Uh, ALU operations um, just chose um, a handful of uh, what seem kind of useful. We've got a barrel shifter in there, so, so we can do a right shift and a left shift in a single cycle. Um, maybe that wasn't such a good choice for this CPU because there's not a lot of um, long shifts going on. It would have been probably better off with just shift left one and shift right one. Uh, we can do a um, memory read by doing this. This just loads the um, top of stack with memory uh, addressed by the top of stack. Ah. Uh, when we're writing um, code, the um, thanks. Uh, we do. Uh, I tend to write things um, in a very factored way, um, just to save room because code density is kind of important for this project. We definitely don't want to run out of room again. So, for example, here's the minus um, word. Uh, what minus does is it negates the top of stack and does a, an addition. Well, addition, you saw it on the previous screen, um, is actually a base word. And, uh, but negate isn't. We don't have a negate. So negate does an invert, which, which is a primitive, and then does an uh, one plus. One plus is defined as one and plus. So when you're doing a minus, there's quite a lot of stuff going on, but it doesn't take a very long time because uh, we've always got single cycle call, and the return, because it's just a bit in the instruction, is um, done in parallel with uh, the operation. So, in fact, uh, uh, for example, this guy does uh, negate, only takes, um, I think, uh, three clocks. It does the invert, and then it branches to one plus because it, it's the last, um, the last call in a, in a word gets turned into a direct br branch. Um, and it pushes one and does a plus and does a return in the same cycle as doing the plus. So things end up being um, quite uh, cheap as far as call and return, which is good for factoring. It's, it's really rewarding to be able to factor stuff when you know that you're not going to be incurring a big overhead. Um, uh, and of course, it saves room. Uh, here's how it's actually built. Uh, the whole thing is a... Is a uh, my earlier versions had used multi-cycle um, dispatch, but the, this time I went for single cycle, uh, so there's no pipelining. Um, but one of the um, interesting aspects of the microblaze is that they used a lot of pipelining to get their, um, to get their clock speed up, but then didn't really have um, very much... Um, uh, they didn't really get a very high clock speed, even after all that pipelining. They, they still only ran at 40 megahertz. So... With this um, particular pipeline arrangement, uh, we're getting about um, 80 megahertz um, with a single stage, with no, pipelining at, with no um, pipelining at all. So what happens is, what we're looking at here is, a, is the span of a single instruction uh, going from RAM all the way through to the RAM writes. So the instruction comes out, goes into the instruction decoder. At the same time as we're reading, the, um, uh, reading memory and reading the top of stack, uh, the R stack and um, the D stack all go into the ALU, and it does all of its um, computations in parallel with this decode. It, it was kind of important to get this speed going, to get this parallelism between the decode and the ALU, is that the ALU kicks off immediately. The ALU doesn't need to look at the um, instruction decode before it starts all of its work. And then it produces all 16 results, which then get selected according to what the instruction was. Um, it's... It's a, some fourth machines um, do things like um, support uh, memory offsets by using the add operation in the ALU. Uh, that introduces an immediate delay because you've got to wait for the decode and then feed that back into the ALU so it knows what to add. Here, the ALU, when it's doing the add, it always knows that it's just adding T to N, the top of stack to the next on stack. Um, so those always um, uh, get kicked off immediately. And add is like a really long operation. In fact, it's the, uh, it's the longest chain in here, is this add chain through the ALU. 
Uh, that mux uh, outputs the new topper stack. That, that gets written to the D stack, ready for the next cycle. Uh, there's an optional write to the R stack, uh, optional writes into RAM. Um, this RAM is, um, of course, um, block RAM in the FPGA, and it's really fast. It's, it's much faster than the logic in the FPGA, which is, uh, which is obviously the bottleneck here. But the RAM's fast, and we're working it hard, because every cycle uh, we're using one port to do an instruction read, and we're uh, using uh, the other port to do a, um, uh, effectively, we're, we're reading from the address given in the top of stack. So this, this guy's working every cycle. Um, of course, we do the uh, read and we feed, uh, we do the read of the uh, top of stack and then we feed it into the ALU. Um, and then we don't use it a lot of the time. It's only if the instruction was actually a read that it gets um, fed through and then muxed out. So effectively, we're doing these RAM reads every cycle on, just on the off chance that maybe there are, the instruction actually is um, uh, a fetch, which is not very power efficient, but there you go. So one of the goals was code density, and uh, it was uh, a big difference. Um, the I squared C implementation in the old C code was, was really long. Um, and of course, uh, this isn't really like for like because, because I cut a lot, of, uh, a lot of that code came out. But something like the Flash interface, it's the same basic set of operations, read a page, write a page. And we were getting um, uh, a fraction of the size. Uh, the same with uh, ARP is a basic network protocol because one of the things that, that has to go into this is, is handling the network stack. So, so we've got to uh, read uh, network packets. ARP is a, an addressing protocol for advertising uh, your address over the network. And here we go, 16384 bytes, and, and that's where it was when, uh, when we started. And like for like, we had so much room left over, we could start thinking about putting new features in. It was great. Uh, some more comparisons. Uh, this microblade CPU core was enormous. It's, it's 6,000 lines, and I'm not sure all of those lines were right, and I'm not sure anybody could ever <laughs> know if, they were any, if there were any bugs left in it. So it was one of those systems which has no obvious defects in a, in a, in a bad way. Our CPU that, that we're using now has just 200 lines of Verilog, so it's a pretty direct expression of, of this chain of operations that I showed you on the timing diagram. Uh, it, there might be bugs in it, but um, at 200 lines, it's much easier to code inspect. Um, obviously, the code size I've already talked about, the clock speed, we've got a much higher clock speed. Um, uh, we could have uh, uh, maybe done better if... Um, uh, on a, a more expensive FPGA. I think the vertex line have better clock speeds. Um, something that, that nobody really takes into account is, the, is how long it takes to build the tools. We actually never built the Microblaze uh, GCC compiler tool chain. We just passed around a binary because it, it takes hours. Why would anybody want to change the GCC when, you, when it takes a whole morning? But, of course, with the tool chain that we had for this, this guy, it, it, it was maybe a tenth of a second which like, really encourages you to refactor the tools. If, it, if you're stuck with this guy, it's, 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 you, you're gonna, and if you make a mistake when you're, when you're changing GCC, it's hours before you find out what you've done wrong. Here, it's, it's instant. Uh, in conclusion, uh, four CPUs are easy to make. We spent much less time starting from scratch with the fourth CPU than we spent struggling with the, uh, the old off-the-shelf microblaze thing. Um, code size is a fraction. We didn't have a 6,000-line CPU. We had a 200-line CPU. But also, we didn't have all of these DMA controllers because the CPU was so slow. We could just do it in software. It's a lot easier to code inspect a while loop and say, that's fine, than look at, look at multiple DMA controllers. Um, and because we've got so much code, we can now fit a whole bunch more features um, into the actual um, product which I have running right here. <laughs> it's still up. So this is the um, camera. It's a bit fragile. It was never really made to live outside a robot. It's, it's meant to be bolted into the robot sh robot's head. So it's streaming its, its video out over Ethernet into the... Uh, where are you guys? There we go. 
much coffee. <laughs> so it's got a, this one has a wide angle lens with a color filter. Um, and it's streaming out that uh, 64480 at 30 frames a second. That's just a while loop taking those uh, pixels, putting them into the network interface, and then sending out packets. Um, there's, there's a few other housekeeping things it does, but that's basically the entire task of it. Yes, exactly. Um, it's stable, and it's it's we did it. We put in one of the features that we couldn't fit in the old core was um, uh, keeping a running um, exclusive OR of all of the lines that we've sent in the frame, and then sending that at the end of the frame as a checksum. So if a single packet gets dropped, we can recover that missing line. Yeah, this is what this is doing now. So. Um, uh, because UDP is, is obviously not guaranteed, uh, because you send that extra line, you can cope with a single packet loss in the frame, which was, which was good for us, because we've got six of these going all the time. Collisions happen um, every few seconds. So you're sending one pixel per packet? Uh, we send, uh, actually, the way we've done it is a final line at the end of the frame, which is the exclusive OR of all of the lines in the frame. Okay. And, and, <laughs> Um, sorry, no, it's, it's each packet is one line. So we're sending 600. Yeah. And then the last packet is this running XOR that you do vertically? Yeah. yeah. Why sure. do you invoke the overhead of the packet per line rather than per frame? Oh, but the, the sensor doesn't only has a tiny amount of room in order to uh, buffer the um, frame. We don't have enough storage. So this, this frame is much bigger than the memory of the um, CPU or the FPGA. It's like, it's like a third of a megabyte. Uh, as well, yeah. yeah. Sorry, another question? Oh, <laughs> no, just waving. Uh, so that's that. Um, uh, it was a big success, and we're probably going to be using more fourth-based um, small things on the network to meet our hard real-time requirements. The robot has a bunch of uh, controllers in it, uh, which are running in a one kilohertz loop. Uh, and uh, we're probably going to be using um, uh, just another variant of this uh, to, um, uh, to run that one kilohertz loop for its, uh, all of its um, joint controllers. So that was work, um, and I uh, had at home um, an FPGA development board lying around, which I thought I'd um, put the CPU onto. Uh, this is um, made by a company called XS. It's got a Xilinx, a big Xilinx FPGA on it, um, and it has... Um, a whole bunch of peripherals. It has another um, network adapter. Um, it has uh, some flash and some RAM. Um, and most fun of all, it has um, a VGA connector. It, it exposes some VGA pins. And so you can write some Verilog uh, to, um, uh, to trigger the VGA. Uh, it's uh, not complicated. Uh, here we are running at 800 by 600. Uh, so the screen that you're seeing is being generated by the um, Verilog um, uh, VGA that I, um, uh, that I wrote um, a few nights back. And what we've got here is uh, a character display. Here you can see the characters are, are uh, being generated um, out of a little RAM. And... Uh, because I wanted to have some fun, I put some sprite hardware into the, uh, into the VGA uh, generator. So each of these is a little uh, bit field, uh, and it's uh, spinning them around uh, using a uh, sine and cosine table. But this is um, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, current... Uh, time, of which I have five minutes left. Um, and this is um, obviously the clock. It's being drawn on the screen um, using that um, VGA controller. But what's interesting about it is that it's not actually um, uh, 
computing the time internally. It's querying an NTP server because um, what we've got here is um, an Ethernet adapter. So it's going through the Ethernet back to Apple's time server, asking Apple at one hertz what the time is, and then rendering the time up on the screen. So it's a clock. And occasionally, you'll see it miss a second as a packet gets lost somewhere. So there's some code. And Apple tells us uh, the actual NTP time. And then you can see the NTP round trip time there as we go to apple.com and ask them what the time is. Uh, this is the, so that's using the same network stack that we used for the camera just running on this board here. So I showed you on the front screen that we had eight hardware sprites. Um, this is uh, a bit more fun. This is um, uh, using the same eight hardware sprites, but uh, as the raster goes down the screen, we're swapping the sprites in and out to uh, multiplex them. So, so there are actually um, uh, 128 blobs here. So every line, the sprites are being um, uh, swapped in and out uh, to give us the illusion of uh, 128 sprites. Uh, and that's, so his kind of the, um, uh, the um, hardware approach here is to do the absolute minimum in the Verilog, because Verilog is maybe the world's worst language for factoring. It's, it's just terrible. It's, they've taken the don't repeat yourself principle and, and dropped the D. It's just everything in it you have to specify over and over again. So it's really unproductive to be working in Verilog. So I've done the absolute minimum in the Verilog, which is a, the minimum number of hardware sprites. And then the thing which is swapping out the um, uh, sprites and doing all of this raster chasing is in fourth. Uh, There's just a big while loop while it loops over the lines in the screen, managing this, um, uh, this virtual resource. And to finish, this is uh, using the same thing Right, we're playing a simple game, um, still using those same eight sprites. Uh, there's, there's plenty of CPU available to. Uh, am I going to? Uh, plenty of CPU available to um, uh, to run the game, do all the math for the movement, uh, manage the states, um, and then virtualize these sprites. So those same eight sprites are being swapped out as the raster goes down the screen. We're loading up the new sprites, and the um, uh, game is, uh, and the screen is set up in such a way that there are never more than eight things on any one line, so we never run out. Um, and they're not especially aggressive. Good thing. Yeah. Uh, yes, they are. Uh, and that's um, all I have. Well, we had, a, we had a specific goal, and it was certainly a lot less time overall um, to, um, uh, to get us um, in a, to the same point than we had spent on the project overall. In fact, several efforts had been made to get, uh, to get the camera going with the old system. And so it had been quite an expensive project, and it suddenly became a very uh, cheap project taken from a standing start with the fourth system. But that was because I know fourth. And I'd built a CPU before. Who can say? I mean, if, if, you're, if you're pushing forth in an organization and nobody knows forth, then there's going to be some wrong turns there. I mean, for example, I didn't, I didn't put on the, um, there's no uh, interpreter on the, um, on the target hardware. We just used a cross compiler. There's no dictionary on the, on the target chip. Um, that's a, a shortcut I took in order to um, not run out of memory. Yeah.